Um, thank you guys. Thank you, Julie, for the introduction. And thank you guys for coming and hanging out tonight as I talk about some of the research that we do. Um, it's always fun to be at the Cabrillo Aquarium because there's just such a long history with uh, Cal State Long Beach in particular. Many of us are graduates or have some connection to Cal State Long Beach. Um, and so we're always kind of proud to see the students here, um, often volunteer. And then, of course, Julie is a, an alum of Cal State Long Beach. Um, so again, thank you guys for coming to hang out tonight. Um, I wanted to kind of start out by just a small little introduction. Um, I love being an integrative biologist. We kind of um, go all the way from that biochemistry, as she said, up to um, going out in the field and trying to use these tools to see what types of health uh, impacts they might have. And this is very similar to what you might have in a, a um, clinical setting for human health, right? Where you go to the doctor, they take your blood, um, and they look for these biomarkers of, for example, high cholesterol um, or other types of um, ailments that you might be having. And they try to help you in some way to kind of predict your, your health impacts. And so we're an integrative lab. And um, I wouldn't have a lab if it wasn't for some really great collaborators and some really great students. Um, I'm really lucky to um, collaborate with Christine Whitcraft at Long Beach, um, as well as the Zacharel Lab at Fullerton, which I'll talk about a little bit today. Um, and some of the stuff I'll talk about today, too, is some of the um, remaining collaborations I have with my members at uh, UC Davis. And um, all of the great students, I was kind of putting together the list of the students here on the slide, and I kind of smiled to myself of, I ran out of space after all the, the different students that I've, I've worked with. Um, and so this is kind of my first cohort that I had when I first arrived. Um, and just some really great students that have gone on to places like Scripps um, or the National Institute of Health. Um, so I'm pretty proud of um, the lives I get to touch at Long Beach. Um, and then also being an integrative biologist, I often describe myself as greedy. Um, being integrative allows me to really dig into different pools of funding. So I'm very fortunate to have some funding through um, the National Institute of Health, um, as well as um, the USCC grant, um, which is a NOAA uh, funded institution. So um, I've been very fortunate at Cal State Long Beach. And to start us off, I wanted to kind of paint the picture of kind of the complex nature of pollutants, um, where we kind of think of pollutants perhaps as this large disastrous problem, um, where this top picture here, kind of gray, um, is a whole bunch of waste barrels that had been dumped into the Love Canal, which is on the East Coast. And this was um, in the 1950s, a lot of these waste barrels carrying some of the legacy pollutants that we're worried about were just dumped into um, this canal and then they were actually buried um, and left to uh, pretend that they didn't exist and of course that never happens right um, so they ended up getting in the groundwater and affecting the love canal community um, and one of the first kind of um, natural or um, a large scale um, news uh, kind of attack to this story. So that's a really an obvious problem, right? This is a huge amount of pollutants that they put into the world. So this is the legacy. So this um, dumping that happened before some of the regulatory agencies came on board. Or we can kind of look at our, um, our pelican here. This is a pelican um, after the BP spill in 2010. Again, this is a very obvious impact, right? Where um, we still have these disasters, unfortunately, but they're fewer. Um, um, which is great. But now kind of put that legacy and those disasters with this ever number of chemicals, chemicals entering the environment. So you can think of pesticides that we're spraying on our agricultural fields. We can think of uh, the pesticides we might use in residence. That of course all enters into waterways after a rainstorm. And then we can think of all of the things that we use ourselves, um, our personal care products or pharmaceuticals. That goes down into the waste stream. Unfortunately, uh, treatment plants aren't able to remove all of that. Um, and so you just have this myriad of chemicals in the aquatic environment. And unfortunately, it's not um, one chemical, right, that's causing the problem. It's that complex mixture of those chemicals. 
And so this age-old problem um, of kind of how they do it in regulatory agencies versus kind of where we're trying to go with a little bit more new age of an approach, um, instead of looking at one chemical at a time, let's just try to look at the mixture and see what it's doing. And so this age-old is, I call it the death assays. Um, and so the death assays is one chemical, they would try to see um, what amount of that chemical would cause lethality or death in those animals, and then they would try to regulate um, kind of how, what type of risk it posed to the ecosystem. So this is still the regulatory practice today for things like effluent, for example. So if effluent doesn't cause lethality, it's not toxic, right? Um, but we need to shift our mindset from lethal to these, uh, we call them sublethal, those long-term effects that might be happening in uh, fish or invertebrates that are exposed to all these crazy compounds. And so uh, what our lab does is kind of lives in this world with this picture with um, the mullet here on, oh my gosh, your guys' uh, left, right? Right. Um, and so for this, this is just an example, a whole bunch of chemicals um, coming from agricultural uh, practices, for example, where uh, they often mimic uh, hormones that we have in our own systems or fish have in their systems. And so the mullet is being exposed to something that mimics estrogen in this in this uh, study. And so they, what they do is they used biomarkers to come in and say, well, we know that they're exposed to this estrogenic compound. Do we have a biomarker that's suggesting that it's causing some type of a physiological problem? And so what they found in this mullet from um, this uh, waterway or this system is that it actually had something called intersex. So this mullet is a male uh, individual and he has both the uh, male gonads as well as uh, eggs being produced in its gonads. So he has sperm production as well as egg production. And so it doesn't take much to kind of say, well, that's not right, right? So this is a great biomarker and a great example of um, this is an estrogenic problem and this fish would likely have uh, reproductive problems. And we can go one step further in something that's a little bit more high throughput. Going in and trying to look at these uh, gonads is a little bit time intensive. So let's try to find something that's a little faster um, that we might be able to work with. And so one of the bio biomarkers that we work with a lot in the lab is the transcript. And so I'll use that word a lot today, uh, the transcript. And so how this works, I'll take you guys all back to biology classes. Hopefully we've had some. Um, and so your cells are really great at kind of reading the cues of their environment. And how it actually normally works is something very similar to what we're seeing here for estrogen. So we have, I'm sorry if some of these are very small, I wasn't prepared for a TV. Um, um, so what we have is an estrogen or an estrogen mimic. We'll get into the cell and it will interact with an estrogen receptor. The estrogen receptor then, um, how these receptors work is they actually sit down on DNA and then from DNA they turn on the expression of a transcript. So we're seeing here mRNA. And the mRNA is what ultimately becomes a functional protein. And so that's how your system and a fish's system or invertebrate, the, how they're gonna interact with their environment and respond to what might need to take place. And so there's lots of different biomarkers, in particular um, this one that we're seeing in this picture with estrogen, um, the protein vitelogenin. And vitelogenin is an egg precursor, so it should only be in female fish. But whenever a male fish is exposed to an estrogen mimic, you'll have this um, expressed. So you'll have extra amount of vitelogenin if a male fish is exposed to an estrogen compound. And we know from this biomarker, uh, vitelogenin, that we can connect it to that incidence of intersex that we just saw in the mullet. And studies have used other biomarkers to carry it out further to where we actually know that this will cause population decline in certain fish um, in about two years. So for estrogen, for example, we have a ton of data. We can kind of connect these biomarkers to real problems. Um, some other types of biomarkers that are really established are these two here. Um, there's many more, of course, but um, the cytochromes, so uh, CYP1A and glutathione sulfotransferase, so GST. These are enzymes that your liver uses to help you get rid of toxic things. So when you're exposed to something toxic, they will uh, work to make them less toxic and get them to leave your body in things like urine, for example. 
or um, another one, uh, ABC transporters. This came of all the rage with cancer drugs. So what will happen is uh, when your cell is exposed to a cancer drug or a fish is exposed to something toxic, they will increase these transporters and these transporters literally kick these drugs out of a cell. So they're uh, a mechanism to protect you from toxic things. One more example, um, metal stress. When a fish is exposed to a lot of metal, they will increase expression of this uh, metallothionine. Um, metallothionine kind of gives metal a hug, and so it removes it from becoming toxic because it's kind of removing it from that cell. And so we have all these biomarkers that we can connect to higher order or um, impacts or uh, pollutant stress. And so we wanted to apply some of these uh, known biomarkers to studying oyster health in Southern California. And so um, here we're looking at Upper Newport Bay, where in Upper, New Paper, in Upper Newport Bay, um, the Whitcraft Lab and the Zacharel Lab have put in these oyster beds. And these oyster beds are a mechanism that we're really trying to establish as a way to combat sea level rise. Um, but they've been um, mixed results in different estuaries and there's not a lot of information as to why they might be successful. And so we partnered with um, the Whitcraft Lab and the Zacharel Lab to use some of these biomarkers to see if pollutants or other types of stressors might be contributing to their health. And so we went to these beds um, that they've established in in Upper Newport Bay, and there's four different locations where they had implanted these oyster beds. So there's um, a bed at, or several beds at Shellmaker, um, De Anza, Westcliff, and uh, PCH, where PCH is going to be closest down to um, that uh, road, PCH. And what they did is they have four different bed types. And so they had oysters all by themselves, um, oysters paired with eelgrass, or oysters paired, I'm sorry, or eelgrass alone, or just a mud flat to kind of see um, their interest is uh, that sea level rise and erosion. Our interest is the health of the oysters. So we really focused on the oyster alone sites or the oysters with uh, eelgrass. And so for our question, um, we know that if you put oysters paired with eelgrass, theoretically that's gonna be better for helping with erosion. But actually uh, eelgrass will cause extra sedimentation. And so extra sedimentation might happen on those oyster beds and that would carry more pollutants. So pollutants really like um, sediment and so oftentimes they'll carry uh, that sediment with them. And so what we did, this is a, a master's project for Amanda Barra in the lab. And so what we did is we went out and we studied the pollutants that might be in the sediment. So here's Amanda collecting some sediment near um, one of those oyster beds. And then we also collected oysters. Um, we dissected out the gills for use in those biomarker assessments. And then we took the rest of the tissue to see what type of pollutants were in the tissue itself. And so we did that at each of those beds um, with uh, different types of replication. And um, here's just a snapshot of the chemicals. Uh, so this is total organics, and I'll uh, show what type of organic pollutants we have in just a second. Um, and our initial hypothesis was that those paired sites would actually have uh, more pollution present because of the fact that they're bringing in that sediment load. And um, that was not the case. So right now, whenever we sampled, there was not really a large difference between those oysters alone versus those paired alone. And we're thinking that's likely due to the short nature of how long the, el the eelgrass had been there. So we're hoping to go back. Um, so the eelgrass had only been there for about six months by the time we had uh, sampled. So um, hopefully a more long-term study might um, change that story. Um, and if we look at um, the breakdown of the type of pollutants that we found in the oyster tissue, um, common uh, contaminants that we look for for organics are some of those legacy contaminants. And the legacy contaminants that we see here are the um, OCPs, so those are organochlorine pesticides. Those are our friends uh, DDT, which I'm showing uh, one of the metabolites here as a chemical structure, where DDT was one of those pesticides um, that was dumped up at the Palo Verde uh, Superfund site. And so we have quite a bit of a historic uh, legacy of DDT pollution in our local waterways. 
Um, it's getting better, of course, because it's not an ongoing problem. Um, and then there's also uh, the PAHs. So the PAHs are the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Um, they're from incomplete combustion of um, oil um, and crude oil spills, for example. And so PAHs are generally coming from runoff, for example, um, due to incomplete combustion um, from cars. And then on the bottom in black, we have those PCBs, so polychlorinated biphenyls, which are also a legacy pollutant that um, is a big problem, for example, at Palo Verde. And we see that the white guys here, the OCPs, um, were the, the main uh, tissue or the main organic found in our tissue. And if we were to break down the individual chemicals that we looked for, really it was this guy here that I show as the structure. This is DDE. And so what happens to um, DDT, the pesticide, when it's in the environment, uh, bacteria will cleave off those chlorines and you'll get these other types of compounds. And, and DDE is a estrogenic compound. Uh, we know that it causes estrogen mimic or is an estrogen mimic. And some other things to kind of look at those chemicals that were found in the tissue. We can also go in to the data. We looked at all of the transcripts, so we did whole genome analysis. And um, one of the one that consistently showed up with a correlation to that level of OCPs were these transporters that I talked about. So here what we're seeing is a regression uh, with the different uh, ABC transporters. Uh, we're seeing uh, 1A and 1B, which we don't really care about necessarily right now. But what we're seeing is that um, three of the different uh, OCPs, uh, DDE, DDT, and uh, transnonochlor here in graph B, they all have this positive relationship with the ABC transporter. So the concentration of the pollutant is uh, correlated with the concentration of the transcript. So that's suggesting that the oysters are upregulating ABC to kick that chemical, that toxic compound, out of their system. And then uh, we have ABCB, where uh, not str as strong of a relationship. So it's telling us that ABC1A is the most important uh, kind of stress response that we're seeing in these oysters. And so that's one example. And then we also looked at metals. So in this same study, we went in and we also looked for metal contamination. And for metal contamination, um, we um, also see very similar results as far as total metals, where there was not really a difference between the oysters alone um, and the oysters paired with eelgrass. Um, and there wasn't a, a huge difference between the sites as well, to where uh, we thought perhaps in this small arena that there might be differences in metal, for example, at PCH versus Shellmaker. Um, but they weren't huge differences between the sites. And if we look at the types of metals that were kind of common in the tissue from these oysters um, at the different beds, we can see, um, for example, that iron and aluminum show up a lot. But iron and aluminum, as far as toxicology is concerned, aren't super interesting. They're very common in the environment. And so really um, what's dominating here is copper and zinc, where copper, especially in estuaries or areas where there's a lot of boating, uh, copper is that biocide that they use to remove um, biofouling, for example. Um, so there's often a lot of copper in areas where there's a lot of boating activity. And then zinc, um, zinc kind of follows in with copper as well. And then we have that small little sliver that's the other metals. Um, the other metals are just going to be um, about 20 other metals um, that are important in different uh, types of toxicology. And so one of them um, from this study, from that other metal category, strontium, uh, consistently showed up with the biomarkers as well. So it consistently showed up kind of correlating with the, the biomarkers. And so here for this one, um, the challenge with a, a non-native or a non-model species like the, the oyster that we worked with is that oftentimes we don't know what these proteins are. There's not enough genetic information out there for us to know. So what we're seeing here is just a hypothetical protein. We don't really know what it does, unfortunately. Um, but we're seeing this uh, negative correlation with uh, strontium levels. So there's more of this particular protein whenever there's less strontium. 
And what's interesting about strontium is actually we don't know much about it in toxicology. We never actually look at it as a target in toxicology. Um, but what we, I started to, once we saw this, I started to look into it. Um, it's often used for um, the health of the shell development of different shellfish. And so what you'll have is that strontium will kind of compete for uh, calcium to create kind of the thickness of that shell. And um, not shown, what I'm not showing, um, is we also have data from this study that strontium concentrations correlated with mud levels on the beds. And so what we're thinking actually for this uh, relationship is that the stressor here is mud. So there's um, extra mud falling onto the, the shell beds um, or on the oyster beds and that's causing a stress where mud is known to cause challenges for shellfish like development, for example. So we think strontium is kind of a, a marker for uh, mud stress. And so again, we're hoping to kind of do more of a long-term assessment and kind of go back in about five years and uh, see what types of things we can see with um, that more long-term effect of the eelgrass, um, where this types of work can really help kind of um, understand where we should put these restoration beds, um, where the Lurida species is a, the only native shellfish on the West Coast. And this type of thing um, is really uh, all the rage right now to try to bring back this native species, which was uh, severely affected by different habitat, de habitat degradation. And then I'll quickly go through a very similar study that we did that instead of working in one estuary, we wanted to do something similar um, across different estuaries in Southern California. So we went out and did very similar sampling um, in different estuaries that should have somewhat different pollutant burdens. So they should have different fingerprints, we call them. And so we went to Alameda's Bay um, in our local area, um, Upper Newport Bay again, uh, Aqua Hediendo, which we thought actually would be our control. Good luck finding a pollutant control in Southern California. <laughs> they don't exist, yeah. Um, so it definitely was not a control. Um, and then we went down to San Diego Bay as well, several locations, um, due to the unique nature of San Diego Bay. And so this again was a master's project of Aaron Sugimoto. Um, and we took a very similar approach. Again, we went out and we uh, collected sediment. Uh, we dissected those oysters. Um, the oyster tissue was uh, for uh, contaminants. So again, that organic and that metal contaminant. Um, and then we also took those gills to look at the biomarkers. And just some snapshots of uh, what Aaron found is, again, now this is total organics, those same classes. Uh, we have the PAHs, um, the PCBs, and those pesticide, the OCPs. And what's interesting now for these different estuaries is we're actually seeing, um, especially in the San Diego Bay, we're seeing that in San Diego Bay, there's a huge influence from the PCBs. So those um, legacy PCBs that were used pretty heavily in the 1950s. And in both species, so we did two different oyster species, the Pacific oyster, just to see if the non-native was maybe dealing with pollutants better than the native uh, Lurida species. And so both of them are showing similar patterns, especially in uh, San Diego Bay. Um, and this particular site in San Diego Bay is right near, uh, we called it the boathouse, but um, it's right near the naval yard in San Diego Bay. And so large amounts of PCBs. And what we found then is actually in these uh, samples, the oysters, the gills, um, had huge expression of uh, glutathione sulfotransferase, where uh, GST is that liver enzyme that that, um, will upregulate to deal with uh, pollutants or xenobiotics that might be in a system. And so in this case, uh, GST is really correlating with the uh, PCB levels that might be present in the naval yard. And uh, one example then from the metal side of life. Uh, now again, uh, here we are, these are different metals. Um, we went ahead and removed um, iron and aluminum uh, just to kind of uh, remove that from view. And again, we're having copper and zinc as our major contributors to the uh, metals that would be detected in tissue. And that little sliver at the top, the other metals. 
And for this particular story, what we're kind of looking at are those uh, total metals that seem um, interesting. And so we see, for example, that uh, we see that those controls, for example, um, that we thought the aqua hedienda, that they were polluted, but um, in the incidence of metals, they actually had the least amount of metals compared compared to the other site. Should I keep going? That's my oh, okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, okay, so um, Aqua Hedienda um, ended up having the least amount of metals that were present uh, in their tissue, and that correlated with the expression levels of those metallothionin um, proteins that um, help remove. So um, the other areas that had higher metals had higher metallothionin um, versus what we're seeing here in red, uh, Aqua Hedienda. So again, it's showing that those other areas are experiencing metal stress, um, and Aquahedigendo is having less stress from metals. What we uh, are hoping to do with this type of study is, as we kind of already said, with that idea of uh, restoration sites or help with uh, management, where those sea level rise um, or those oyster beds are being used across the country as a way to combat sea level rise. And so that's what we have going on in this picture. You might imagine if you have a shoreline that doesn't have anything to break the tides or those different ocean um, currents coming in, then you're going to have a lot of erosion taking place. Um, but a lot of what's happened historically has been concrete. So they'll put in a concrete barrier instead of something um, that's a little bit more uh, flexible. And so the oyster beds combined with, for example, eel grass are a better solution theoretically than uh, concrete. And so they would provide this buffer zone uh, for erosion and to kind of break those tides up a little bit. And this approach for the Lurda in particular is taking place all along the, the west coast. And so it's not just for sea level rise, it's also trying to bring back that Lurda population. And currently there is literally no data outside of ours for toxicology on the Lurda species. So this work is kind of helping to inform um, some of the toxic endpoints in Lurda. And then hopefully we can try to kind of inform where they're putting these beds. Uh, potentially we can um, use these biomarkers for figuring out um, how stressed they are, not just from pollutants, but things like changing salinity, for example, that might also be stressful. And um, as I move forward, I kind of now want to move forward from these uh, established biomarkers that we talked about, that there's been a lot of data. For example, um, the estrogenic pathways, people have been studying those since the 80s. So there's a lot of data really connecting this biomarker to some type of a fish population effect. And so where uh, my interests really lie and about half of my lab kind of lives is this interest in calcium. And when I say calcium, always, everybody always thinks bones, um, where calcium is really important to bones, of course, and bone strength. But what people don't really realize is how important uh, calcium is on the inside of the cell, where calcium really drives um, pretty much every physiological pathway you can think of. So I just have kind of broad categories here. Um, so calcium really drives development, all the way from fertilization um, into things like the neuro on development pathways, uh, muscle contraction, the reason I'm standing up here dancing around, or the cardiac function, that's all due to calcium. Uh, neuronal health, so neuron to neuron communication is all due to ca calcium. And then last, last but not least, endocrine pathways. So uh, the way in which a hormone leaves the cell is because of calcium. So uh, hormones will be made inside the cell. Calcium will help uh, make sure that it gets into the bloodstream. And so calcium is involved in a lot of pathways. And unfortunately, there's currently not a, um, a biomarker to help assess the effects of pollutants that might alter calcium inside of the cell. And so that's where a lot of my interests lie, is um, these chemicals that might be a neurotoxicant or muscle toxicants. And so um, at the center of these uh, calcium pathways are these two proteins here, the ryanine receptor and the uh, CAV1 channel, so the L-type voltage-gated channel. And um, here we're looking at uh, the neuromuscular junction, so where a neuron meets the muscle. 
And these two uh, receptors or proteins are going to be uh, communicating uh, to make your cell uh, respond to a neuron. And so we know that multiple pollutants will kind of target these two proteins. Um, for example, those PCBs that we've talked a little bit about, um, flame retardants that are often found in things like upholstery or computers, for example, all of our electronics, um, and pesticides. So um, some of the newer age pesticides that are in use pretty heavily will target these pathways as well. And if we kind of span out of what's happening at this junction where that neuron is meeting that muscle cell, um, these two proteins, you can kind of see them uh, communicating to each other. So they're kind of uh, friends to where here the CAV1 channel is going to respond to that neuron and it's going to open and allow a lot of calcium to come inside of the cell. That's how you're getting that neuron to muscle communication. And then your ryanodine receptor is then going to allow a lot more of calcium to leave, um, we call it an internal store, um, into the cell as well. And that, co that communication is what drives your muscle cells to contract. And uh, again, we know that these different pollutants will target these pathways. And some really cool stuff that you can do with uh, fluorescent microscopes. I'm sorry, this uh, video does not work. Last time I checked, let's see. Nope. Um, all right, so what happens, uh, you can use fluorescent microscopes to watch these changes in calcium in real time. And so whenever you get a higher glow from this fluorescent scope, that means that there's more calcium present inside the cell. And so we um, have these skeletal muscle cells here that we could watch these changes in calcium. And we can kind of look at those uh, changes, these peaks, uh, to see how they're affected by these pollutants. And so if we just look at these two graphs, the top one is a control cell kind of responding as it normally should, versus on the bottom we have a cell that's been exposed to PCB. And we see that the amplitudes are lower, for example, so those peak heights are much lower than what we're seeing on the controls. And what's um, kind of the most telling from this graph is if you look all the way at the, back, the end, that bigger peak, the wider peak at the very end, um, you see that the control has this very healthy kind of large peak at the end versus on the bottom here, you see this little tiny peak uh, taking place. And that's a sign, a telltale sign of muscle weakness. So what you have with uh, PCBs in particular is you kind of have an overexcitement that takes place. And eventually from that overexcitement, you just get really exhausted. And so PCBs will cause muscle weakness because your cells just kind of get exhausted from constantly responding to this chemical. And so we want to um, take this and try to get new biomarkers to detect these neuromuscular toxicants. And so the challenge is that we're talking about calcium, right? Calcium itself is not a protein. It can't do much work other than act as a signaling partner to proteins. And so whenever we um, have now looked at this estrogen that we kind of uh, saw in previous pictures, right? Where estrogen comes in, it interacts with the protein, and it goes to start this transcription process. Where um, for uh, calcium, calcium cannot do that without a protein partner. And so we would like to really focus on this protein dream as kind of our candidate for developing a biomarker for neurotoxicants. And so what we have for dream, uh, we don't actually care much about dream. We do, right? But in the, the world of biomarkers, what we're interested in is what it's producing. So that downstream target or a gene that's going to lead to um, a function. And so DREAM is unique because uh, DREAM will just sit on DNA. So whenever there's no calcium, DREAM just sits on DNA. So you won't get transcription of certain genes. But once you have a lot of calcium, uh, DREAM will bind to calcium, remove from DNA, and you get transcription. So you'll get these uh, proteins um, that respond to calcium. And a lot of the studies with DREAM are um, really involved in endocrine pathways. So a lot of what's out there so far for DREAM is endocrine pathways. And uh, most of the data is in the hypothalamus. 
So the hypothalamus is at the base of the brain. Um, and if we think of the hypothalamus, it's kind of the beginning of the reproductive pathway. So the hypothalamus uh, talks to the pituitary, um, and then the pituitary sends a message to the gonads. And so here, um, the hypothalamus produces this protein known as uh, GnRH, so gonadotropin-releasing hormone. And that is essentially the start of um, controlling the cycle of ovulation and controlling the cycle of sperm production. So if you mess with GnRH expression, you'll have problems with reproductive capability in males and females. And so um, DREAM regulates the expression of gonadotropin-releasing hormone. Um, and so we are trying to uh, use GnRH as that biomarker for neurotoxicants. Another one um, that DREAM is heavily involved in is insulin production. And so here we're looking at the development in fish, where everywhere you're seeing that black arrow, that's gonna be where you're seeing um, either the DREAM protein or the insulin protein. And so what this is showing in fish development is that uh, the DREAM protein is uh, in the pancreas and it's correlating with insulin expression. And so what we're not seeing is some other data that other people have done um, in a cell where they have uh, without a doubt shown that DREAM regulates the expression of insulin. So these are two biomarkers that we're focusing on um, to kind of understand calcium signaling disruption. And so for some of our data, uh, we're focusing on these two chemicals here, triclosan and TBVPA. Uh, so triclosan is an antibacterial agent that's been uh, used in consumer products. Um, so it was always uh, called a market value compound. So it didn't have much use really, it was just kind of, they put it in there as a marketing to show that it could help with antibacterial uh, protection. And so a lot of it's been banned at this point, but it is still in some consumer products. Um, and then TBVPA uh, is a flame retardant. And it's currently the, currently the highest uh, used t uh, flame retardant. So it's in all of the uh, upholstery of uh, things like couches, for example. It's in a lot of our electronics. Um, and so both of these chemicals are known to inhibit that CAV1 channel uh, here on the outside. And so if you have these chemicals, what they're gonna do is they're gonna stop calcium entering into the cell. So let's start with triclosan. This is some uh, data. I'll show uh, the um, mouse studies so far and then some fish studies. At the top, we have those fluorescent microscopes where you're seeing um, that calcium spike in cardiac cells. So these are heart cells. And so in the control, you're seeing these really nice calcium spikes as they should to have that um, really good um, heartbeat. Versus once you have triclosan on board, you have a very uh, silenced calcium spike. Um, and then you can correlate what we're seeing inside of a cell. And you can look then at um, the cardiac output. So this is um, in a mouse that's been exposed to triclosan, they have reduced cardiac output, which means uh, reduced blood flow. And then the other graph here, B, is showing a grip strength. So it's the mouse's ability to grab something and hold on to it. And so again, both of these are showing uh, weak muscles due to the exposure to triclosan. And we found similar things with uh, fish exposed to triclosan to where what we did is um, we exposed them to triclosan for different amounts of time, um, including triclosan that would be present in the water. And so here what we did is we just did different behavioral tests that would be related to neuromuscular health. And so we see kind of this non-provoked activity, just its general movement. Uh, predator avoidance, where we kind of traced it around, uh, chased it around to see how, how long it could keep up endurance. And then last but not least, uh, feeding, so how well it was able to kind of capture its food. And so what we saw is again, um, that they're having uh, problems kind of coordinating muscle or that neuromuscular muscle reaction. And so at just one day, for example, they're having less activity uh, when they're exposed to triclosan. Um, they're having issues kind of getting away from a predator and they're having less food. 
And what often happens in toxicology studies is um, over time, uh, animals can kind of compensate. They have ways that they can overcome these toxic out outcomes. And you'll see some effects kind of go away. But as soon as you kind of extend that um, event of exposure, you're going to start seeing those problems reappear. So what we're seeing at four days of exposure, we don't have as much impact as then when you push it out to seven, you're seeing those impacts appear again. So in mammals and fish, we're seeing that uh, neuromuscular suppression with triclosan. And so we used this as our kind of control chemical that we knew did something um, to fish and mice. And uh, we exposed a hypothalamic cell to uh, triclosan. And then we looked for GNRH expression as our biomarker. And so uh, here's our cells plated on this plate. And basically in the food of these cells, we added that triclosan. And our hypothesis here is right that um, if we have triclosan on board, it's going to block that CAV1 channel. Calcium cannot enter, and DREAM will just stick onto DNA. And so we should have a decreased expression of GNRH. And that's exactly what we saw. And so now, again, we have uh, the cells are exposed for three hours, uh, 12 hours, or 24 hours. And I think it's pretty easy to see um, that you're having this strong reduction in gene RH expression uh, when they're exposed to this uh, CAV1 inhibitor. And so GNRH is a good biomarker that we're um, trying to look for in an animal instead of a cell. Um, because cells are a little bit easy, where once you go into an animal, right, um, animals have things like livers. Uh, livers help break down chemicals. So we want to kind of take this further and see about biomarkers in a fish, for example. And so that's what we're doing um, then with uh, the zebrafish model, which is a great model. Um, it has a tons of tools. So if you ever go to um, a fish store, for example, the zebrafish is a fish you can just buy from a fish store. Um, and so we have a culture on campus so we can kind of watch development from the embryonic stage to that larval stage. And then we can also see some effects in the adult fish as well. And so we expose these guys now uh, to TBB. PA. So we have also um, done those studies in the cell with TBBPA and it causes an effect. So we're uh, now looking um, in the fish, again with that same hypothesis. So TBBPA should block the CAV1 channels, uh, calcium can't come in, and so we should see reduced expression of these uh, dream regulated genes. And so right now we kind of have uh, some early uh, data that we have available. And what we have is uh, insulin expression uh, right now where we exposed the adult fish for two weeks to different levels of uh, TBBPA. And we exposed the uh, embryos for five days into that larval stage. And what we're seeing kind of interestingly is that the adults are seeing an increase in their in insulin production um, versus the larvae that are having that, what we would have expected with that decrease. And so potentially there's a compensation taking place with the adults with that longer time period of exposure um, and or um, they are having a different response to TBVPA. So this is kind of early studies. We're currently working on uh, reproducing this to get more replicates to um, see what we can get. But um, organisms are always a little bit more complicated than what you would have with a cell. All right. So where we're taking this with the biomarker is uh, we're going to go into some uh, cells that uh, produce insulin. And so there's different cells in the pancreas that produce insulin. Uh, the main ones or uh, produce hormones. Um, the cells, the beta cells here in the middle, those are the ones that are producing our insulin. Uh, so we're uh, working to kind of establish the insulin cells in our lab right now to study how DREAM with a pollutant might affect insulin production. And then we're going into the zebrafish to try to look at glucose homeostasis. So we can look at, um, for example, blood glucose levels um, and then different types of uh, insulin production and that glucagon, where glucagon is kind of that response to insulin after you eat a large meal, for example.
Um, and with that, um, hopefully I didn't talk too fast, but I'll open it up to any questions you guys might have. And uh, thank you guys for taking a molecular journey. Any questions for Dr. Holland? Yeah. Um, you mentioned that you Name dream is that an acronym for something? Or is that it's uh, an acronym for something. Yeah, I tried to uh, not drown you guys with complex names. So it's the downstream regulator um, modulator of uh, transcription. Yeah. Be it just happens to be dream, yeah. It's complicated when you do like uh, manuscript searches, it brings up all of these like dream, and I'm like, no, 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 the other dream. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was wondering, I understood what you were talking about, you know, if something's fatal to a fish versus if it's um, making it act in a not typical way, like procreation, that type of thing, stress. Uh, what government agencies do you report this to to help ban these substances? Yeah, um, so I'll just say, um, kind of fortunately or unfortunately, um, the toxicology world is egocentric, right? So if you can show that it has a human effect, you're in a much better place than if you can say that it has a, um, a effect on fish or heaven forbid invertebrates. Like, um, <laughs> so the ultimate goal often is to um, show that there's these effects in mammals, so um, that that really translates to a human population, and then theoretically, then you're you're protecting the, the fish. Um, and so some of these tools that I'm kind of talking about today, like the cells, that is something that's regulatory standard in human health toxicity studies and pollutant studies. And only four of those types of cell things are taking place in more of an environmental fish item and they still are not um, so currently the state water boards are kind of implementing that and they're only working with things like estrogenic mimics um, growth hormone uh, problems so they're really focused on endocrine pathways which is I always uh, laugh to my students it's kind of my chip on my shoulder like let's move past endocrine disruption but still a major problem for sure but um, these neurotoxicants receive much less attention in the environmental world um, yeah Question. Yeah. In terms of eating seafood, <laughs> yeah. what you've just talked about. Yeah. <laughs> what's your thoughts on well particularly the two that you talked about, like oysters, what's your yeah, um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't eat oysters from Southern California. <laughs> um, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily eat oysters from our estuaries in our local environments. Um, but there are some, for example, Tamales Bay up in uh, the San Francisco area. I think that's where a lot of restaurants get their oyster populations. I know that San Diego Bay. Um, is trying to, my student here, um, Amanda, she actually works for the Port of San Diego and they just started oyster beds there. Um, and so it's just, they're not meant for consumption just yet. Um, but there is a oyster bed down in that Aquahidiendo, that's why we thought it was our control site. Um, and those are meant for um, restaurants um, at the Aquahidiendo Carlsbad Aqua Farm. Yeah. The oyster beds in uh, Morro Bay. I think those would be better than Southern California estuaries. Just estuaries in Southern California, right, have been so degraded in general that they don't flush as well as they used to. Um, thanks to Christine Whitcraft, right, a lot of her work is really trying to restore the estuaries in our local environments. Um, but they've just been so degraded, so built up, and had this legacy of pollutants on the on top of it that, um, yeah, so the if you go up north a little bit, but those would be a little bit, um, I would suggest cleaner oysters, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, this is kind of a strange <laughs> biologist or anything, but uh, I was looking at, I was just turned on a few days ago to this uh, bioanemo uh, NVIDIA game, the, these graphics processors that they use for artificial intelligence, and they can do things like finding protein folding from the genes. Yeah, yeah, Incredible yeah. Incredible stuff. Yeah. And look at, looking at the detail in which you find all of these interactions between the different hormones and, yeah. and everything, and how they interact. I mean, it's like, um, have you 
are some of your students are here to get some of these things and like is it possible to like if somebody was coming up with a new chemical or something you know, could they predict in some way that yeah. it's going to make the shells soft? That's going to be a challenge, yeah. So um, that's a really great question. So um, uh, for the work that Amanda did where I showed those regressions with those ABCs, she actually used, um, it's called a neural network, which is a type of uh, coding that you do to try to like predict different things. And so that's how she found those things. But that's like bare minimum AI, right? It's not even AI. I don't think, um, but there is um, there are these methods that have been around a long time. They're called QSARs, so it's a quantitative structure activity relationship. Yeah, so you can look at the structure of a chemical and you can predict that this would be estrogenic. Um, or this would cause neurotoxicity. And so we do that kind of on a soft scale. I'm not a super strong mathematician for sure. Um, but um, in general, I think in toxicology uh, and especially in aquatic toxicology, um, industry will always and currently is so far ahead of us that we're constantly trying to play catch up, right? So by the time they get a new chemical out there, we're like, wait, 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 wait. I think that's bad, like don't do, so they're, um, the human side, again, with these cell buyout, these cell assays, they're moving much quicker, but it's still kind of in its infancy. Let's do a question from home. Yeah. And I forgot, I apologize to everybody at home. I apologize. I forgot to tell you to repeat the question. Oh, I'm so, so sorry. I've been able to hear the I'm so sorry. So I'm just talking up here. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, there's a question from home. Um, it seems that there's a lot of testing on estrogen in the environment and what it does as, a, as pollution. Seems like a bias is testosterone ever studied. So, so, so kind of repeat that. So, uh, so the question is uh, whether testosterone receives as much attention as estrogen. Um, a poll, a straw poll would say no, but there is work that does study androgen uh, testosterone effects. So for example, the state water board currently has those four assays that it's using. One is estrogen, one is testosterone, I, a growth hormone, and I want to say the other one is uh, glucocorticoids for stress. So testosterone does get its heyday, but it's not as uh, <laughs> as publicized as estrogen for sure. That's, that's the only one from home. There's oh. more here. <laughs> Unless there might, there might be some more coming in. Any more from, from my body? If nothing changes on the corporate side, What's your prediction in the next 10, 20 years? What happens? <laughs> this is like my career question. Um, I will. Thank you. Um, so the question and uh, interest is really if we keep going at the rate that we're going um, and there's no change in corporate um, activity, um, what's going to be the, the problem, like the long-term challenges we're facing? Um, I think that... Um, it's only gonna get worse, I guess, which I think that's an easy answer, but um, consider the other challenges we're facing um, and corporates not um, changing in those realms either, like climate change, for example. There is a known correlation kind of with um, the more changes we're having to the climate, the more pesticides we're gonna have to apply. And so now we're having this dual challenge. Um, and I didn't talk about it, but we're a little bit involved in like the plastics conversation in the state and California is uh, one of the leaders in the globe kind of driving these, uh, these standards, but um, you think of places like uh, in disadvantaged communities in Africa, for example, they don't have water, so what are they gonna do outside of bottled water, for example? And so um, really there has to be this grassroots push for these corporations to um, 
and it has to be monetary, unfortunately, I think, right, to where they have to make them up front pay for a plastics is an easy one. Um, but for the bottles that they create, they have to pay to get them back. So uh, governments have the money to go in and solve these problems. And that used to be the case with Superfunds. I don't know if you guys know Superfunds. So Superfund was developed after all of these like major um, dumping problems that they had. Um, and so when EPA came on board um, in the 70s, they started the Superfund, which literally was a trust fund that companies had to pay into to help clean up these things. Um, and that's what's paid for a lot of the uh, remediation action at these sites. But um, that went away at some point. Um, and so almost a trust fund, right? A trust fund, uh, these companies have to pay. Uh, do I know how that would happen? I'm sorry, no, I don't. Um, but yeah. Thanks. Thank you guys so much.